Hello Penguinauts! I am the Beardy Penguin and this is the N1 Rocket, or more accurately a Lego model that I built over the Christmas holidays. Now this of course was the Soviet answer to the mighty American Saturn V moon rocket and it was supposed to launch the Soviet moonshot but unfortunately well, or perhaps fortunately, if you're American, every single test flight of it ended up in a massive explosion. I just thought I would take the opportunity, now I've built this model, to have a little chat about the design of the rocket and the key differences with the Saturn V over here, um, and walk you through what a Soviet moon mission might have looked like. Now this design you see here, uh, it's not completely my own design. Um, the original design was by Woodpiece and placed on Reddit and it's been sort of updated by a few people. Um, first by Fitzrurisk and then uh, Spangle. I followed his instructions for the first two stages. Um, most of the top of the rocket I've completely changed. I've actually added a fourth stage and the whole lunar complex and everything inside the fairing. So the proportions aren't exactly Right, the third stage is a little too big, the fairing's a little too small. The N1 did characteristically have four grid fins at the base of the first stage, but I didn't have the pieces, and they were actually surprisingly rare. A better design by the Bricks in Space guy is in the works, but that's not finished yet, so this is what we are working with. This is actually the paint scheme of the very first test launch, which has, as you see, the change to white paint on the third stage, at least half of the third stage. Later designs had more and more of the rocket painted white to try and control some of the thermal issues it had on the pad but I think it looks uh, really quite distinctive with most of it, this light grey colour. And it is light grey, that's a bit of a misconception. A lot of people seem to think that the N1 was olive green, and I think that comes from Russian ICBMs being olive green to camouflage them. But yeah, there's there's no camouflaging this behemoth of a rocket sat on the launch pad. Anyway, let's give you a, a little bit of an overview of the rocket. Now, as you can see, unlike the Saturn V with its five mighty F1 engines, the N1's first stage is powered by 30 NK15 engines. And this is what most people point out as its big design flaw, what caused it to explode. Oh, it just had too many engines. Silly Russians, next time design stronger engines. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. Having a lot of engines isn't necessarily a design flaw. The Falcon Heavy has 27 engines in its first stage and that is yet to explode. So it's not a fundamentally bad idea, especially when you have engines as powerful as the NK-15, which were the first staged combustion cycle rocket engines that were ever flown. Now, of course, the staged combustion cycle, I won't go into the full details, but essentially you have a pre-burner which powers the turbo pumps for the engines, which feeds the propellant into the combustion chamber, and the actual products from that pre-burner are fed into the combustion chamber and not actually dumped over the side like they were on open cycle engines such as the F1 over here. Now the real reason that this rocket failed is it had one tenth of the funding of the Apollo program and that means they didn't have the funding to create the testing facilities necessary to do integrated tests of all the stages. The only way they could test any part of this rocket was to launch it. Having a lot of engines means you have a very complicated plumbing system and most of the causes of all the failures would have been identified in, a, in an integrated test on the ground, um, but they just weren't able to do them. So they couldn't work out the kinks in the plumbing system for all of these engines. And that was really the cause of all the failures. Not only that, but although work on the N1 actually started in 1961, uh, the lunar mission was only approved in 1964. Yeah, that's, that's two years after Kennedy's speech and three years after the Apollo program began, although of course it wasn't called the Apollo program just yet. Unfortunately, this rocket, you know, might have actually got somewhere, but its lead designer, Sergei Korolev, died in 1966. And although he was a great engineer, he was so irreplaceable simply because he was a magnificent politician. In the Soviet Union, if something didn't have a military purpose, 
as well as a space exploration purpose, it, it just didn't get made. And that's one of the core reasons why the N1 didn't use any liquid hydrogen and oxygen powered stages. All of its main stages were powered by liquid kerosene and oxygen, unlike the Saturn V, which is the main reason why the Saturn V, with its liquid hydrogen powered second and third stages, has so much more delta V and payload to low Earth orbit. Liquid hydrogen engines are only really useful for upper stages for space exploration. They're not storable propellants, they're not that useful for intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so they just didn't get made. And also Valentin Glushko thought that liquid hydrogen was completely infeasible as a propellant for a rocket engine. Something that a lot of people don't know is that the Vostok mission, which put the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, that only got approved because the Vostok capsule doubled as a Zenit spy satellite. Interestingly enough, the N1 was actually pitched to the military as being capable of carrying and delivering the SAR bomb, you know, the largest nuclear weapon ever detonated on Earth. But the response from the military was pretty lukewarm, so work really didn't get going on it until, as I said, 1964, and as the Gemini program started to leapfrog the Soviet Union in their outer space conquest. So we're going to move into the key differences with the gorgeous Saturn V over here and obviously the main difference is the propulsion whereas the Saturn V has characteristically five F1 engines as I said the N1 has its 30 NK15 engines designed by Nikolai Kuznetsov because Valentin Glushko who up to this point had a pretty much a monopoly on rocket engine design in the Soviet Union refused to design engines for it. Um, there are a number of reasons why, as well as just hating Korolev and thinking he was incompetent, um, they disagreed on the fuel to power the rocket. Of course, Korolev wanted to use kerosene and liquid oxygen, which is what ended up being used, but uh, Glushko was a big fan of hypergolic propellants, although use of these on a manned vehicle is uh, is questionable, which is why Korolev did not want to use them. As I said earlier, the engines used a stage combustion cycle, which made them significantly more efficient than the F1 engines, even though they weren't powerful enough to lift the vehicle, and hence you had a large cluster of 30, with a little inner ring of six, and then the outer ring actually being used to control the vehicle by using differential throttling of the engines to control its pitch and yaw. The grid fins, which I don't actually have on, but of course would have maintained its roll control. Now, one of the most characteristic differences between the N1 and the Saturn V, as well as being a little bit shorter, is its conical shape, whereas of course the Saturn V has a predominantly cylindrical shape. And that is because the N1 used spherical fuel tanks. So you had a large liquid oxygen tank and then a smaller kerosene tank above it. And of course the differing sizes of the fuel tanks meant that the outer skin of the vehicle had a conical shape. Now the reason why spherical fuel tanks were used is because Soviet manufacturing wasn't actually capable of producing aluminium plate thick enough to support the weight of the entire vehicle. Now the Saturn V uses integral fuel tanks so the outer supporting walls of the vehicle are also the outer walls of the fuel tanks and the fuel and the oxidizer were actually separated by common bulkheads which is an extremely efficient tankage setup. The Soviet design, on the other hand, had a separate structure design. So you have the separate outer skin of the vehicle, and then you have the spherical fuel tanks inside, of course, being spherical because it is naturally the strongest and hence lightest um, shape for a pressure vessel to take. Unfortunately, it's not very efficient uh, volume-wise. So of course, you have these large voids between the actual fuel tank and the outer skin of the vehicle. And the spherical tanks, of course, do minimize contact between the fuel tanks and the outer skin um, during launch, but uh, all in all, not a very efficient tank design. Another key difference you'll notice are these lattice fairings between the first, second, and the second and third stages. 
unlike the Saturn V, which had closed fairings between the stages. The fuel in the stage needs to be settled at the bottom of the tanks for the engines to ignite properly. Now the Americans did this by using small rocket boosters to separate the stages, settle the fuel at the bottom of the tank, and then ignite the next stage. But to save a bit of weight and complexity, the Soviets did a thing called hot staging, which is where you actually ignite the engines on the next stage before the previous stage has finished burning. So you start cycling these engines before the first stage detaches. Of course, the exhaust products need somewhere to go, hence you have this lattice fairing so that those exhaust products can escape out the side before you separate the stage and continue on. Now the consequences of all of the design decisions I have mentioned were that the N1 had a 95 tonne to low earth orbit payload capacity compared to the Saturn V's 120 tonnes. So now we've talked about the main features and key differences with the Saturn V, I'm going to walk you through what a Soviet moon mission might have looked like. So starting with block A, or the first stage, the 30 NK-15 engines were light, producing 45 mega newtons of thrust, which <laughs> made the N1 the most powerful rocket in the world. And that's compared to 34 mega newtons for the puny Saturn V. So these would burn for about 125 seconds, with the first stage being controlled by CORD, which is a Russian acronym for simply control of rocket engines. Now this was a computer control system that monitored the engines um, and throttled them to maintain control of the rocket. If any of the engines failed, what it would do is shut down the opposing engine to make sure that the rocket maintained its control. Now this was a very finicky and unreliable control system. Um, of course, it wasn't able to actually handle rapidly progressing events. And as such, on the second test flight of the N1, when a turbo pump exploded, it shut down all of the engines on the first stage, resulting in the entire rocket crashing back onto the pad and producing what was at the time the largest non-nuclear explosion in history. Near first stage separation, these six core engines were actually shut down to reduce the strain on the vehicle because of course as the fuel is draining, the vehicle is getting lighter and the g-force that it is subjected to is increasing. This was actually the cause of the fourth launch failure. The shutdown and the resulting shock burst some fuel lines and started a fire. But if that hadn't happened, then the second stage would ignite early and then the first stage would detach and it would continue on. Now I'm going to see if I can detach this somewhat elegantly. Houston, we have a problem. Well, it looks like the Saturn V has had a catastrophic launch failure. Very uncharacteristic. Must be living in the For All Mankind timeline. <laughs> okay, we're back on track. Crisis averted. So we're 125 seconds into the flight and block B, or the second stage, ignites its eight NK-15V engines, which are pretty much identical to the first stage engines, just with a slightly different engine bell and tuning to start in flight and for some better high altitude performance. Now the N1 actually had more thrust in each of its stages than any of the respective Saturn V stages. So we've got 14 mega newtons of thrust in this second stage compared to five for the Saturn V with its five J2 engines. Now, of course, the Saturn V would now be using the extremely efficient liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen powered J2, and so would get a fair bit more delta V out of this stage. Now, block B would fire for 120 seconds, and then block V would ignite its four NK21 engines before detaching the second stage. And now we're moving into block V, which has four NK21 engines, which are vacuum optimized variants of the NK15. And this stage would fire until depletion for 370 seconds, placing the entire fourth stage and lunar complex into orbit. Now that is in contrast to the Saturn V, which would only do a short burn of its third stage to go into orbit and then do a second burn of the third stage with its single J2 engine to perform its translunar injection. 
Now, before the third stage would detach, we would lose the launch escape system and we would open the first fairing. And this rocket is like a Russian doll, no <laughs> pun intended there. So the launch escape system would carry the escape tower away from the vehicle and the payload fairing would deploy, exposing the fourth stage and the lunar complex. Shortly after, Block V would expend its propellant and it would detach. And now we have Block G and the lunar complex in orbit of the Earth in comparison to the Saturn V, which would have its third stage ready for a second burn. Now, Block G was powered by another NK-21 engine. This would be what sends the lunar complex on its translunar trajectory. Now, an interesting difference between the two mission profiles is that the Soviet mission would go into a polar orbit from Baikonur in comparison to the Apollo missions, which went into a similar inclination to the moon itself. Now, Block G here would fire for 440 seconds and send the lunar complex on its translunar trajectory. After it was expended, we would then deploy this second payload fairing. This one isn't uh, quite so easy to remove. Oh, hello, the land has fallen out. So after detaching, so after detaching Block G and deploying the associated payload fairing, the lunar complex would be on its way to the moon. Now, I think we're all quite familiar with what the Apollo mission would do at this point. It would perform the transposition and docking maneuver where, of course, the command service module would detach and would extract the lunar module from its payload fairing. And then, of course, this would then continue on to the moon. Now, Block D here was powered by a single RD-58 engine, which produced about 85 kilonewtons. And interestingly, is quite different to the service propulsion system used by the Apollo mission. Now, whereas the service propulsion system used hypergolic fuel to try and keep it as simple as possible and guarantee that it would ignite as there was no backup for it, the RD-58 actually used turbo pumps. And I'm not sure if this is the Russians showing off or whether they just needed the performance <laughs> to be able to pull this mission off. It was powered by liquid oxygen and RP-1 kerosene like every other stage on the N-1 thus far. This would perform two major course corrections on the way to the moon and then would slow into a roughly equatorial orbit around the moon. Now in the Apollo missions, of course, we know that there would be a crew transfer of two into the lunar module. It would detach and then the lunar module would descend to the lunar surface. However, things are quite different with the Soviet mission. Now, there wasn't enough in the mass budget for a sophisticated docking system that could transfer crew between the tiny one-man LK lander and the Soyuz 7K variant. As such, a single cosmonaut, most likely Alexei Leonov, who was the first man to perform a spacewalk in orbit of the Earth, would have to get out of the Soyuz and do a spacewalk across to the LK and get in, check out all its systems before beginning his descent. And this would, of course, be the first time anyone had ever performed a spacewalk in orbit of the moon. Now, the LK lander didn't actually have enough Delta V to land on the surface and return by itself. So it would detach from the Soyuz, leaving the single remaining occupant of the Soyuz in orbit. And then Block Day here would actually perform most of the descent. Block Day would carry the LK lander to a few hundred meters above the lunar surface before detaching and crashing into it. Then the LK would ignite its single RD858 engine and descend the remaining few hundred meters down onto the lunar surface. Now, it had such a limited amount of fuel for this maneuver that it was only actually able to translate a few hundred meters in either direction. And of course, there are craters way larger than that on the moon. So the way this was prepared for was by actually designing the LK to be able to land on anything up to a 30 degree 
incline. Now the way this was achieved was of course with quite wide landing gear but also four small solid rocket boosters which would actually fire upon touchdown and press the LK into the surface and arrest any potential lateral velocity it might have. Now the LK lander is, as you can see, significantly smaller than the LEM from the Apollo missions and it was only able to carry a single occupant. Furthermore, it only actually had one stage, unlike the LEM, which of course had two separate stages for descent and ascent back up into orbit. However, it did actually have some advantages over the American lander. Unlike the Lunar Module's ascent engine, which had no backup whatsoever, the LK actually had a backup RD-859 engine with two separate nozzles that could have acted as a backup if the main engine failed and propelled the LK back up into orbit. Both engines on the LK actually used hypergolic fuel so it could be stored for long stays on the lunar surface. Of course, after landing, our single cosmonaut, probably Alexei Leonov, would get out, say a few words about the workers of the world or Marxism or something, plant a flag and then get back into his LK and then using the same engine that was used to descend would power back on up into orbit. Although the LK would actually leave its landing leg assembly on the ground but uh, I couldn't figure out a way to have one piece uh, <laughs> as the landing assembly at this tiny a scale. So the LK would then fly back up into orbit, rendezvous with the Soyuz 7K and dock. Now unlike the US system, this is becoming a little bit of a trend, everything that the Soviets did just seemed to be a little bit of a B-Tech version of the Apollo mission, but uh, the docking system didn't actually have a pressurized tunnel for crew transfer as I mentioned earlier. It was just a simple harpoon and hexagon sort of shaped contact system which would just hold the two vessels together so that Alexei Leonov could then perform yet another spacewalk carrying his lunar samples with him across to the Soyuz and then of course the Soyuz could detach the LK which would deorbit into the lunar surface and the Soyuz would return back home. Now apparently depending on the mass of the lunar samples recovered the Soyuz might have actually left its orbital module in orbit of the moon and just gone home for a three and a half day journey with the occupants stuck in the tiny descent module which I'm sure would have been extremely unpleasant but of course this would return back to earth and the descent module would be the only piece to make it safely hopefully back to the earth's surface. So there you have it the mighty N1 rocket and its associated Soviet lunar mission explained in comparison to the Saturn V and the Apollo missions that we all know and love. Thank you very much for watching everyone I do hope you enjoyed this new kind of different kind of video for uh, my sort of channel. If you enjoyed this, please do let me know in the comments below. Um, I'm thinking I might do one on the Mir space station in comparison to the ISS set or perhaps something on the LK lander, which you saw a, uh, <laughs> a much smaller version of here than, uh, than the scale of the lunar lander set. Uh, perhaps I'll knock one of these up, I'm not sure. Um, I've got all sorts of ideas for videos like this, so let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. Thank you for watching everyone, I've been the Beardy Penguin, and I'll see you next time.